Back in the 1980s, Commodore was a very popular home computer with models such as the VIC-20, Commodore 64, and Amiga. They also produced many high quality color monitors for their computers and today we're going to look at a model 2002 which is very similar to the 1984-1991 models. Mono sound, RGB inputs, the works. This is an old Commodore analog monitor manufactured by Fujitsu General Limited in Japan. Manufacture date on this one was March 1987. And by many, these were considered to be one of the finer analog monitors that you could get of the day. One thing to keep in mind if you're looking at any of these commoner monitors is some models such as the 2080 used a long persistence phosphorus on the CRT, which resulted in a long afterglow. Now this would reduce the apparent flicker on interlaced displays such as from the early Amigas, but it also resulted in a less than perfect picture when watching video. On the back, you will see audio video inputs and video chroma. This is because this could accept an S video signal. Using a, an appropriate cable, you could have your video and chroma separated. So this was, in, in a sense, the very first S video televisions or S video monitors ever produced. The commercial S video followed shortly after with a four pin connector, which appeared when Super VHS and Hi8 started to hit the market. But prior to this, the only devices that use separate video chroma were these computer monitors, which actually used it as a separate plug. And I actually have a cable that I've got made up, which will give me separate luminance and chroma from an S video cable. Whether I can dig it up to use it on this, this video or not, I don't know. But I did have a cable made up that would give me uh, an S video cable to um, two separate RCA plugs, which I used to use with my uh, macro scrubber. So I, I would use my macro scrubber on the luminance only, but not the chroma, if I wanted to say, make a tape copy of a DVD back in the day. It also features an RGB input, which can operate as an analog RGB or digital. The problem with this one is the picture is flickering. You can see, instability. Other than the instability, this one has a very good picture. So I'm thinking somewhere in the circuitry, maybe there's a bad connection. Well, when I tap on it, it doesn't seem to do much. It just has a mind of its own. Or it could be an intermittent transistor. But uh, somewhere in there, something is not right. And we're getting picture instability. So this video, I'm going to try and make this thing give me a perfect picture. That's just a bit of dirt. The picture tube on this is, is an excellent condition. Fantastic picture. I can adjust my controls here. But um, this instability problem is is part of the problem with the set. As you can see, it uses the Toshiba tube. This is a high resolution computer grade tube, an E2940B22, little 14 inch tube. And they're gonna be driving this to relatively high voltage, probably 25,000 25, volts, I would think, on the second anode on this one. As you can see, the entire video amplifier board is completely enclosed in a metal shield and that's because these sets operated both as an analog and a digital monitor and the fear was back in the day that digital signals with their rapid switching because with the digital it's either on or it's off uh, with the rapid switching levels of voltage but for the for the video output that it could cause interference so they a lot of the older computer monitors they shielded the board itself. It wasn't so much of a problem with analog signals because analog signals, of course, the intensity of the of the signal is always fluctuating. But with digital, it was the switching from a one to a zero, that hard switch that 
was feared would cause more interference. And it, it does to a certain degree, but this is kind of overkill. But it's like the early plasmas. The early plasmas also had a lot of shielding on them, which we saw go away in the in the later generations when the interference wasn't as bad as they had initially expected it to be. You'll notice that there's a separate little small transformer here. Very small transformer. I have no idea what this one's for, other than it's probably, because it's such a small transformer, this thing here, like I said, is only gonna be outputting a few milliwatts of power. You see this little guy here? Um, I think probably what that's for, I'm just looking at where the wires go, and they go down, they go down here into the board. This might be for the video isolation, because this is going to have a hot chassis. In other words, the uh, the chassis itself would be directly connected to one side or or to, well to one side of the line more than likely. Although this has I've got a grounded earth chassis, I think probably, and I haven't dug into the circuitry on this one, but there's probably opto isolation where they're using low voltage from a small transformer to operate the video circuitry that is connected directly to the plugs. And then there's an opto isolator. In other words, they're using an opto coupler to couple the video and audio signals from the plugs to the uh, the, the main video amplifiers. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing because I've never opened up one of these ones. But generally, that when you see a small transformer like that, it's for a standby circuit or for some type of isolation. Now, this is not a remote control set. There is no standby on this. So it's got to be for the isolation for the video, for the input. So I'm thinking this is probably to drive amplifiers that then operate through optical couplers to couple the video audio signals from the isolated input on the back to the main chassis, which is going to be hot. We look at the, the CRT here, you can actually see inside. The graphite coating that they've put on doesn't extend all the way to the front on this one, and you can actually see the back of the screen. I can see looking in here, I can see the, the inner workings of the uh, of the shadow mask. You can see it in behind here. It's a metal that holds the shadow mask. And you can actually see it in behind the tube here. We'll look at it with a flashlight. The first thing I'm going to check on this set is there's a switch at the front that is used to select between the digital and the analog inputs. And it also will select between the YC mode and composite. And I'm going to try cleaning that switch because it's possible, it's hard to see, it's right down here. Right down there. Oh, let me lower the camera a bit so you guys can see it. So it's right down here in behind these blue wires. But there's a switch right down in here. And I down in there anyway I want to try cleaning that switch first I'm just going to spray some contact cleaner in that switch and activate it a bit and see whether that's going to be causing my problem it might be something as simple as a switch that hasn't been activated in a long time because I believe this monitor in its life it was used only as a composite monitor it wasn't used as a YC monitor it wasn't used as an RGB monitor at least in the time that it was used before I got it. Uh, it was used just to monitor composite signals off of like satellite receivers and stuff. So it's possible that that switch has never been turned or if it has been, it hasn't been moved much. So it's possible that that switch has just uh, built up some oxidation. So let's get in there with some cleaner. We'll try cleaning that switch first and see whether that will alleviate the problem on this monitor. It could be as simple as a bad switch. So I've got my can of neutral contact cleaner. Let's see if I can get in here and clean this. I can barely see where I'm getting at in this thing. I don't think this board will pull out much more without 
disconnecting a bunch of stuff. I don't really want to have to pull the board out all the way unless I absolutely have to. But there's the switch I'm after. I can get my flashlight to stay in place so that I can see what I'm doing. I can get my spray in there. You might be wondering why I didn't just try spraying it in from the front. Well, the problem is it's got a cover over it, so from the front, you're not going to get any cleaner into the switch itself. Okay, let's turn it on. Look at how quick that tube warms up. That's amazing. The picture tube on this thing is excellent, and it has an excellent picture. And the accuracy of those colors as well. Here's the switch. It's down here to switch between composite, separate, and RGB. RGB, separate, is that middle position. Notice there's still some color leaking through, but that's I think, normal on these things. And uh, full color position. But no more instability. Uh, we have a horizontal position control over here where we can shift the picture back and forth. And I'm sure there's probably a width control on this as well. We can turn down the, the width to make this more of an underscan or close to underscan. It has a vertical hold. So one of these monitors would be, would be perfect for adjusting the width on to bring the picture in so that you can see the entire image without overscan. Let's see if I can find the width control on this. The picture width is adjusted by adjusting the slug in L452 down here. Uh, that needs to be done with a plastic type a coil a slug adjustment tool. Uh, if you put a metal one in there, there's a good chance you're going to break it, but also a metal tool will affect the width while you're trying to adjust it. So you really need to use one of the plastic alignment tools, which I don't have. A plastic alignment tool of that correct size for that I don't think I'm just looking through my I got one plastic one here but I don't know that it's going to be I don't know this is going to be the right one we'll see whether I can adjust that width in a bit I'd like to make the picture a little bit narrower if possible just to get more of a closer to full scan as opposed to an overscan image Another adjustment on the back is the vertical height control, which is this little control down here. We're going to adjust the vertical height control so that the image just reaches the top of the picture, as I'll show you. See, we're going to adjust it just so that the image just reaches the top of the screen and no more. And same with on the bottom, just so the image just touches the bottom and the top of the screen. So you guys have now seen how good color bars can look on this little monitor. Let's take a look at how good pictures can look. I'm going to grab one of my media players. I'll play some of my content over this monitor so you can see how good it looks. I know it's, it's probably hard to tell when looking at a, a camera pickup from a, the tube because the camera is going to pick up all the individual uh, color stripes on the tube. If I were to zoom in here, you'll be able to see them. Including the dirt on the tube. 
but this is a very good pitcher. But advance to the next video on here. I forget which button I push. There we go. Just like looking at the aquarium. That monitor has an excellent picture. As you can see, it's nice and stable now, as opposed to before where it was jumping all over the place. So the fault on this one was just that input switch that selected between composite, S video, or separate as they call it, and the digital input, or the RGB input. The switch contacts, just from disuse, and maybe they were moved once or twice, but just from disuse, the switch contacts went bad and we're causing that problem. And other than that, this monitor looks great. These monitors are quite sought after for the vintage gamers. These ones, probably more than any of the other monitors, some of the Sony monitors were also very sought after, but these ones were very sought after because of the quality of the CRT. It's a fine pitch CRT. Um, and they just delivered a really good picture with minimal geometric distortions. Again, they were designed for computer use and monitors designed for computer use were typically very high quality. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you again in the next one real soon. Bye for now.